diaspora. I trust and hope that everyone is having a wonderful Monday evening and you have had a very good start to the week ahead. I just want to say a special good evening to my aunt Janice Moore there in England. I'm sure she's tuned in and she's up as well as my uncle Vaden Jones there in North Carolina. I also wish to say a pleasant good evening to the good folks there in St. Thomas's Parish, my beloved constituency. I trust and hope that everyone is having a wonderful evening. Now, I just want, as per usual, to offer congratulations to those persons who are celebrating a birthday or a anniversary, whatever have you. Um, I just wish to say congratulations to you. I wish to offer happy birthday greetings to Miss Desiree Otley Sider there in uh, um, Spring Hill, I believe it is. I trust and hope that you're having a wonderful day. You had a wonderful day and I wish you an even better evening for your birthday as well as to Mr. Kelvin Hobson there in Cotton Ground. He's celebrating his birthday today. I also wish to offer congratulations to those persons who were honored during the independence um, celebration and they were honored for their contribution, sterling contribution to Nevis and in particular to Mr. Leroy Jr. Paris. Um, he was one of the awardees as well as my good neighbor, Nurse Jessica Scarborough. And so I say congratulations to all of the awardees and in particular those two as well as to Miss Sandrine Caesar there in Westbury. I offer congratulations to her as she was awarded by community, the Department of Community Development for her outstanding work in the community of St. Thomas's. I also, on the same token, wish to offer condolences to those families who may be grieving or mourning the loss of a loved one during this difficult time. I express sincerest condolences to you in particular. In particularly, I'm reminded of the Shiverton family there in Brown Hill. I trust and hope that you guys are your coping and we offer our sympathies as well as the family of the late Bertram Roach, um, Vanessa Paris and the whole lot. We offer our sincerest condolences. So we're going to get right into, the, into the, our show for this evening and we have a very special guest lined up and it is none other than the Premier of Nevis, the Honorable Mark A.G. Brantley. Premier Brantley, we are so happy to have you welcome to the legendary show and we are so happy to have you as our special guest this evening as we reflect on the past 40 years for our independence um, we are indeed happy um, I myself am happy and grateful and um, humble that you have accepted the invitation to be on legendary and for us to have some open and frank discussions about Nevis and our development in the over the past 40 years and perhaps where we hope to go for the next 40 years well thank you very much uh, for inviting me I believe that tonight it was important for me to be here because once you extended the invitation I thought to myself that if we are really what we say we are, which is about uh, development, which is about governance, which is about trying to create a new Nevis, mm -hmm. a better Nevis, then notwithstanding that you and I do not sit on the same side politically, I am still the premier of all of Nevis, not some of Nevis, and that it was important for me to engage. And so I'm here because I think that as a servant of the people, we ought to use every opportunity that we have to engage with our people and so I'm sure that your your regular listeners would have an opportunity to to hear what you know discussion this evening and really to, to see as I keep saying that because people may not always share the same political persuasion it doesn't mean that they are enemies and I think that that's a very important message and we must must not only say so we must demonstrate through our actions that we can have civil discourse civil dialogue because I think it is necessary you for example were elected by the people of St. Thomas's and uh, certainly the people of St. Thomas's have elected you then they see value in you as their representative and you have a duty to present their case to the government of the day whoever that government may be and whether or not you're part of that government 
if you were sitting in the cabinet, you'd have a duty to present their concerns to that cabinet. And because you're not in cabinet, doesn't mean that you have any less of a duty to bring to the attention of the government and those in cabinet the needs of your community. So I feel that it's an important demonstration of maturity. And uh, for me, that is critically important. So thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. And certainly, I think the topic that you wish to discuss is an important topic, looking at independence, at what was and what we hope to be. Yes, indeed. So, Premier Bartley, just um, off the top of my head, we are looking at 40 years. We celebrated 40 years. I trust and hope that you did enjoy the independence celebrations. I mean, it was really historic. Mm -hmm. um, both the parade in St. Kitts, the National Parade, as well as the parade in Nevis. And so I just want to ask you, upon reflection, um, how far have we come in 40 years as a very young nation? Well, I'm happy to say we're a very young nation. Many of us look at 40 years and say, well, you know, I'm a big man or I'm a big woman, and so people assume that you're all grown up. But 40 years is really just uh, a very small amount of time in terms of nationhood. We have to, I think, reflect on from whence we came, because only if we understand from whence we came can we really appreciate where we are and hopefully plan on where we want to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, we must remember that we came out of a period of slavery. Our ancestors were brought here as slaves were forced to work without compensation. Um, tremendous wealth was extracted from Nevis and from these islands across the region. And that wealth went to build other countries, not our own. Then came, of course, the heavy yoke of colonialism. Yes. And uh, certainly the, 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 the United Kingdom, um, as it was, and uh, they were our colonial masters here in Nevis and uh, the wider federation. They, in fact, joined Sengis, Nevis, and Anguilla together for their own administrative purposes. I think the history books suggest that was done sometime in 1882 or thereabouts. In any event, we know that the people of Anguilla were unhappy. The people of Nevis were also unhappy. Eventually, the people of Anguilla broke away uh, by force of arms and decided that they did not want to be part of the, the, the tri-island uh, construct, which was Sengis, Nevis, and Anguilla. Uh, we had then the continuing relationship between St. Kitts and Nevis, but it was always fractured and fractious. It was always a difficult, I used to refer to it as a limping marriage, because I think <laughs> you were married, but it was a difficult marriage. Yes. And I think that those difficulties are in fact reflected in our constitution of 1983, because you look at the document, and while the document has been widely criticized in some quarters, I have always said that absent the concessions that were given to Nevis in that document, I do not believe that the state of St. Kitts and Nevis could have emerged. And so when they talked about independence in 1983, certainly the NRP at the time, being the, the, the party here in Nevis, uh, the CCM had not been formed yet, yes. uh, that the NRP, led by Sir Simeon Daniel, our national hero, would have gone negotiated. And that's how we got the Nevis Island Administration, we got some Nevis Island Assembly, we got some legislative powers, we got some exclusive areas of responsibility. What have we done with that? I think coming from that background, you know, in fact, today I attended a funeral for, for Mr. Bertram Roach, yes. who, as you know, is one of our cent centenarians. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bertram and my own father, of blessed memory, were very close friends. And uh, the stories that I heard today were very similar to the stories that my father told me about the struggles and what Nevis was like then. And to hear that Bertram Roach was part of electrifying Nevis, and electricity didn't come to Nevis until the 1950s. Yes. You know, um, we, we look at, you know, that development that has come. In fact, some people argue that Nevis didn't have a payday until the Four Seasons opened, you know, which was about 30, 31 years ago. So the truth of the matter is that we have to assess where we've come from. We came out of slavery, out of colonialism. We then had independence. Some say we asked for it, some say it was given to us, thrust upon us. Whatever the position, we became an independent nation, a tiny nation. St. Kitts and Nevis, I want our public to understand is the smallest country in the hemisphere. Yes, it is. Right? So we are trying to rub shoulders because we're not in a world which has any sympathy for you because you're small. You're still required to maintain the same standards as large countries. So I think against that backdrop, my analysis would be that we have done rather well. When we look at our economy and what has now happened, I believe the best indication that you're doing well is when you see people who are not from Nevis flocking into Nevis to seek work, to seek opportunity. People don't go to places where there's no opportunity.
just how we would have gone to the Virgin Islands and America and England. You, you, you hail out your aunt in England, you hail out your uncle in North Carolina. That has been our tradition to look, and people generally, to look mm -hmm. for a better environment. So when people start to come to Nevis, I think it's reflective of something good that's happening here on the island. We look at the advent of sixth form here, brought here. We look at homegrown institutions like the Bank of Nevis. We look at the impact of the Four Seasons, and not just them, but other hotels as well. We look at the development of our people generally mm -hmm. right? our females entering the political arena our our young people being empowered you look across our school system now you see mostly young people and in fact mostly young women leading these institutions I feel we have come a long way in 40 years in terms of what the norms now are I am 54 years old um, except that I'm old now <laughs> but um, having been born in 1969 in Hanley's Road, we didn't have running water. I don't think young people nowadays might understand because here, if we have a water um, interruption for 24 hours, people go absolutely bizarre. Mm -hmm. If you have electricity interruption for 24, back in those days, you didn't have water in your in running water in your house. You had to go to a tank somewhere, a dump, as we used to call it, to get water. You didn't have electricity. Uh, we didn't have a meter, so you couldn't get electricity until much later in life. And so these were considered luxuries to us. Now these are basic necessities. Basic necessities. Basic. Mm -hmm. So that is why I say there is a disruption even for a few hours. People take to the airwaves and think us in because it's now become what people expect. Mm -hmm. So the norms have changed. The standards have risen dramatically. Uh, okay. You know, people here are not suffering with the diseases of old. We've eliminated so many of those those diseases that we used to have. I mean, when I was a child, you know, you get people used to get mumps and, you know, I don't know last night mm -hmm. I see people with measles and, 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 and those kinds of things. Scabies. I'm sure you're so young, you don't know what scabies are. I these, don't. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> these were things that, you know, were quite commonplace. Mm -hmm. And those have been systematically removed from our existence here. So I think that on balance, I could go on and on about the level that we've come to and I think the next hurdle that we need now to 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 get over is this question of our politics. I think our politics is still too divisive. Mm -hmm. and but uh, bef before we so get before we get into right. the politics of it, um, now you mentioned that um, clearly there has been some signs of development because we have an influx of people coming to the shores of St. Kitts and Nevis. Now some may argue and perhaps um, our local citizens that development really means um, development in tourism and a lot of persons have asked um considering since the inception of the four seasons hotel back in 1991 and looking at the the economic impact that it had on nevis why haven't there been another um at least um five star hotel or uh, hotel that can um, produce 200 rooms and so i just want to just hear your views on that because people use um hotel and the capacity as well as our airlift as a means of really um, variables of assessing our economic development here on the island of Nevis. So I think it's a fair question um, and the reasons why we have not been able to attract I, I wish I could tell you because we've had so many opportunities where we have engaged uh, from a government point of view we have engaged in terms of, of meetings and concessions and trying to facilitate uh, for some reason these investors have not have not delivered insofar mm -hmm. as Nevis is concerned we've had project after project announced uh, to the point where I have taken the position as premier that I don't announce projects anymore let people come and let them announce their projects we've had small developments like uh, what is called Villa Paradiso or, or now Paradise uh, which is a, a really a wonderful development very high-end but small a boutique property um, now called Paradise Beach uh, but we, we you are absolutely correct we haven't been able to attract that large-scale investment in terms of hotel uh, that we would have liked to attract. Mm -hmm. We're still trying, but we have not been able to do so as yet. The, the question though for me is that I am not, I am not one who argues that our yardstick for economic development is only based on hotels. Yes. In fact, I will tell you that a lot of times when people have asked me the question about hotels, additional hotels, I've said to them, 
that we have difficulty sometimes filling the hotel rooms that we do have. Mm -hmm. And Nevis only has just over 400 hotel rooms. And so when people say, oh, we need another large hotel, the question that I ask is, yes, you talk about generating employment, but even when you speak to the people at Four Seasons, they will tell you that there are times of the year when they're only getting one day or two days a week because there are no guests at the hotel. Mm -hmm. So I have always said that for me, rather than focusing almost exclusively on the idea of can we get more hotels, I prefer to focus on seeing how we can fill the hotels that we have for a more consistent period and a longer period during the year. Okay, so do you think that the our airlift, our airport, the, the fact that we perhaps need more airlift into the Van Samri International Airport, do you think that that has an impact on uh, us being able to fill hotel rooms? And if so, then what are the plans? Um, does it have an impact? I think I would say yes, it should have an impact. But having said that, we also realize that the seasonality of the season, the, 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 the our clientele still comes larger from the eastern seaboard in the United States. When mm -hmm. it's cold there, they come here for warmth. When it's warm there, summertime there, they have no reason to come. And that is why during the summertime here, we go into what we call the low season. Similarly with the cruise industry, they go to the Mediterranean. In the summertime, they come here during the winter time. Um, it is just somehow the way the industry is structured, and it's not unique to Nevis. But airlift is important. In fact, we are now embarking on a project to finally expand the Van Samory Airport. The last work was done there over just over 20 years ago, and the airport has really become obsolete. I think we have to accept that, that is the reality. People's travel patterns and travel appetites have changed. It used to be that Nevisions were very happy to jump on a small plane from here to Puerto Rico, and then jump on a plane from Puerto Rico to get to the US or someplace else. That is no longer the case. People now want the benefit of going to St. Kitts, getting on a jet, getting off in Miami or getting off in New York. And so that pattern has changed. So even when we invested in bringing Seaborn here, for example, and Seaborn was doing daily flights to Puerto Rico, people weren't taking the flight. When we, 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 we invested in Winnie and said we will continue to support financially Winnie, people were not taking the flight. We had trade wind aviation that came that was going to Puerto Rico, and all of them have after a while pulled out because they say, even though the government was paying, mm -hmm. that it was not in their interest to fly empty and to put equipment on this route when people were not taking the flight. So we had a number of problems because we could still have had some viability at the Van Samory Airport if indeed our people were willing to take the smaller planes to get to the destinations and then to connect. But people are saying, that's not my style anymore. You know, I want to jump on the big jet and get off. And I understand that as a question of convenience for some. I do understand it. Um, and so we have decided that we need to expand the airport. And we have uh, an investor who is partnering with us. We're doing a public-private partnership. And we are in the process now of negotiating the lands in the area with landowners. I can say tonight that some have been very cooperative. So we already have uh, arrangements with some. Uh, others are, you know, as usual, holding out in terms of price. So we're trying to have as much discussion as possible so we can finalize that. And we hope to come to the public very soon in terms of some public consultation so that people could understand exactly what we are proposing. Yes. And the buying from the I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned that because that has been one of the buzzing questions. So persons, persons want to know, okay, you mentioned that you, um, you will have an investor, you're now looking at lands. And so I think the general public really just want to know, oh, well, who is this investor? Um, what stage you are at? Um, what, what are the terms of the contract? So I'm happy that you mentioned that there would be some public consultation so that the general public can have a better understanding. Absolutely. But just to ask this quick question, would the public through public consultation, would they, would they be able to weigh in in terms of um, making recommendations, uh, suggestions, even though they would ask some um, informative um, questions? whether they would be, if the government would be in a position to take on some of the recommendations from the public or other stakeholders. Absolutely. That is the whole purpose of the consultation. It's not just to inform the public, but also to get feedback from the public. Mm -hmm. So we are having the consultants, they are actually moving personnel on island very soon. I think maybe within another week. And when they're here, they will lead the consultations for us. Yes. So absolutely, we want the public views to, 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 to feed into the design. 
we have an idea, of course. We have a design in mind. They've come up with something, but we think that getting the feedback from the public is al always beneficial because it allows the public to understand what's happening. It allows the public to have a say, and hopefully it will allow the public to have greater buy-in to the project. So that is the intention, and we'll shortly be making those announcements. Yes. Okay, just um, another question, and this one really comes from feedback from the general public. Now, a lot of persons have mentioned or have asserted that life is had here on Nevis. People talk about um, inflation, the increase in the prices at the supermarkets, the fact that people feel there are no price control and the government is not doing enough to really control prices. So what, what are your views on that? How can you bring some comfort to the people of Nevis? So let me be honest because I am always trying to be practical and I believe that leadership is important sometimes if there is little to be done to be honest with people mm -hmm. I think some people whether as politicians or as leaders try to pretend that they can do all things and fix all problems that is just not so when we look at big economies the UK for example the United States all of them have been crying out over inflationary uh, uh, tendencies since COVID Yes. We understand that during COVID, a lot of factories shut down, so there were some supply chain issues that then led to escalation in terms of pricing. I, for example, thought, and the cabinet thought, that if we removed all impositions in terms of custom service charge, VAT, well, VAT was already our food, but custom service charge, handling charges, all of those things, we removed them completely from food that it would make a difference in the supermarkets. So we came up with a big announcement. We called in all the supermarket owners. We had Rams, we had Best Buy, we had um, Value Mart. Uh, we called them in together and we said, you know, we are so happy to announce this. We want you now to ensure that the savings are passed on to the consumer. And I was stunned, and I'll say so here publicly, I was stunned that the response from them is that they appreciated it, but it won't make a difference in terms of the cost of food. So how do you mean it won't make a difference? And they said the problem was that every single time they ordered from Miami, the prices went up mm -hmm. in Miami. So even though the government was trying to say, okay, we're not going to take anything, we, we, we're cutting out all the charges at the port, it made little difference to them because the prices were going up in Miami, the price of shipping kept going up, and climbing and that really was not something that we can control so we said listen we know that we cannot control the cost of these of, of these goods what we can try to do is to seek to s encourage our people to develop alternatives that's where the food sovereignty and food security and the investment in farming and even encouraging people to a little backyard farm because we thought yes. rather than buying tomatoes from Miami and cucumber from Miami why not uh, in, encourage our people to go their own and by so doing start with some import substitution because we knew we could not control the price of imports and any small government in fact any government which will try to suggest to their people that listen we can control inflation and control the, the, the thing when our economy is an open economy and we are really dependent on goods flowing into our economy if you decide um, honorable to buy a car tomorrow there's no way that you can control that. The inputs into that car, none of them come from Nevis. Those are coming from Germany or wherever your car is being manufactured. And so you are forced to pay that increased price. Now, when the issue of price control, I just want to say something very quickly because I think there's a misconception, widely held misconception, that government controls prices in supermarkets. That is not so. The goods that are subject to price control are what they call a basket of goods. Those are basic items like milk, mm -hmm. flour, rice. Um, sardines I think a couple of very basic items so if you're going to supermarket and you want to buy cornflakes and you want to buy Cheerios and you want to buy juice and all of those things those are not subject to price control um, Prim, if I could just interject, but even the basic, for example, milk, a tin of milk in the, in the supermarkets is goes for $4.80, and that's the cheapest. I have seen some at $5 and, and over $5. So, I mean, people just want to understand, and I think the general public really understand that the government does not control the prices. But at the same time, the prices continue to escalate, even on basic um, staple right. goods and, and dairy products. So how how can we fix that? Because it is a problem, I, and you know how, how can we work together, all stakeholders, in order to fix that? It is, again, I don't see how we can fix it. 
Mm-hmm. Other than the world rebalancing itself. Okay. Because our supply chains don't exist here on yes. island. It's not something that we can say to manufacturers of milk. Okay, we're going to give you some big subsidies to bring down the price. We don't manufacture milk. We don't manufacture most of what we eat. And so, I mean, you talk about milk and food. People need that every day, but you also need to look at things like building materials, which have in some cases tripled in price. So it is very difficult for me to sit here and tell you that we have a solution for inflation because the truth is we do not, with the current makeup of our economy Mm -hmm. and how the economy flows and the fact that, as I said, we have an open economy where we're depending on import of goods in order to sustain us here, our building materials, our transportation sector, our food and uh, sector. So what we've tried to do, as I said before, is to substitute, encourage people to grow more and eat more local stuff because we think that's where we have some element of control. And of course, on the flip side, we've tried to make life a little easier. So for example, the fuel surcharge was something on electricity that was killing people. Right? People thought the government was being harsh or unfair, but the reality is all around the region there's a fuel surcharge because that is the, the accordion-like effect that you get as oil prices increase, the fuel surcharge increases or decreases as the case may be. We heard the people and we actually removed the fuel surcharge. Mm-hmm. People are now saying that they have the lowest electricity bills they've had. Yeah, so but, but it was removed from, from domestic, domestic households. Exactly. However, businesses and small businesses like myself, right. we are still bearing the burden of that cost. You're still bearing the burden of it because we realistically could not remove the fuel surcharge on everyone. And we understood that if the fuel surcharge is left on the businesses, more than likely the businesses are going to pass something through to their customers anyway because the businesses have that capacity. The domestic user, on the other hand, has no one to pass their cost to, mm-hmm. right? So the single mother in Jessops, whom you represent, that single mother has nobody that they can pass on their cost to. So we say if we're going to give relief, let us give relief to those people, knowing fully well that the cost of bread is already going to have the fuel search ad built into it because the bakery is going to pass on the cost to them. So in a real way, those domestic users were paying twice. They were paying their own fuel search ad at home, having no one to pass that on to, and they were again paying through increased costs and prices from the supermarket and the businesses Mm -hmm. who were charging them. So we decided to do it that way, and I can tell you it has created its own problems for us in terms of our fiscal position, because we're talking about millions of dollars. Just last week, um, Neville got in touch and said, listen, they needed some assistance because Delta and that bill from Delta is three to four million dollars a month. Mm-hmm. So I think our people need to appreciate that it comes at a cost. We have also sought to assist our public servants in terms of a salary increase. We have done so far 10%. They have another 5%, 5% percent. that is due in January. So we have sought to increase salaries a bit, as much as 15% over that period. We have removed things like the fuel surcharge. So the purpose of that was to try to give people a little bit more spending power, a little bit more money in their pockets, Mm -hmm. because we understood that they were paying higher costs in the supermarket, especially. I'm more concerned with food because people need food to eat, need food to survive, I'm sorry. So we were concerned about doing that. And so we said, well, okay, let's try to tackle it in these ways. But the truth is that there's very little that a small government can do And as I said, when we look around the world and we see major, major governments fighting over this issue, just two days ago, I think I was looking at CNN and they were saying that inflation in the U.S. is still a problem, but they were, of course, as you know, there they have what they call monetary policy where they use their central bank, their federal reserve to adjust interest rates to try and impact Mm -hmm. the, 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 the economy and the cost in the economy inflation they try to impact it through monetary policy even here we have no control over that we share central bank with the rest of the oecs if you're Mm -hmm. going to adjust interest rates you got to be an oecs wide decision so it's not like nevis can say okay central bank adjust the interest rates to try and influence the the the, the inflationary elements in the economy we just don't have that control so my thing is that i encourage our people to be prudent because i need let me just make this point i know we don't have much time let me just make this point Part of our job, I feel, is also to encourage our people to be responsible and sensible over what they do. Because I will tell you, Honorable, that the reality in the US, and I'm sure you experience it, is that a lot of our people who say they can't afford food and they can't afford it, they find money to afford other things. 
that some of us may look at and say, well, maybe you could have foregone that. Yes. And instead bought. So it's about priorities. Bought, exactly. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people who say things hard, things bad, because they can't get the groceries that they need. When you look at them, you say, okay, but had you foregone maybe the nails or the hair or the late last fit, you might have been able to say, well, okay, you have something. So I think our people as well need to prioritize their needs over their wants. And they need to realize that, listen, with rising prices, maybe I need to cut back. The youngsters, maybe I need to cut back on the number of Guinness I have on the weekend, mm -hmm. right? Because, boy, the cost of formula gone up a bit. The cost of milk, as you say, has gone up. And I need to make sure that my baby has what my baby needs mm -hmm. in terms of formula. School fees, I need to make sure that's covered. So I think we also need to preach that. Sometimes politicians especially like to pander to people so they don't want to tell people those things. Because okay. they say when you tell people those things, people get vexed with you. Or you could dare tell me that. But I think that we have an obligation to say to people, listen, our elders used to tell us you cut your suit to fit your cloth that it's important sometimes that we remember those lessons and a lot of the expenditure I see people engaging in they spend what I call discretionary spending and leave essentials that they then complain about and say but I can't afford to pay for electricity or for water mm -hmm. right and that is a problem for me so I think that okay. that too would help just two questions coming in out of what you said as it relates to the fuel surcharge and the cost. Now, that just prompted me to ask you now about geothermal. Where are we? Can you give the general public an update as it relates to geothermal? And then also, in terms of small business development and supporting small businesses, um, what, what are your views? How can we as a small country, um, small island in Nevis, how can we better encourage um, the support of local businesses? So let's deal with geothermal and then okay. we come to small so businesses. On, on geothermal, I'm hopeful that I might be in a position uh, within the next month to give a, a, a more substantive update. We, of course, know that the CDB approved some funding for the geothermal project, mm -hmm. some 17 million US dollars. That was since the 9th of December last year. Yes. So we are almost into a full year since that funding was approved. We then went through a bidding process. The bidding process was not successful because those who, who, who submitted bids, the, the G CDB, who is leading the, pro the process along with Nevlek, they determined that the, none of the bidders was up to scratch. Mm -hmm. So they decided to go back through that process but to do what they call a, a, a limited bid so rather than going to a, a full bid process you know, they've, they've approached individual companies and are inviting those companies to bid I'm advised that, that process should have finished at the end of August clearly yes. that we found past the end of August so that mm -hmm. process was not finished the last conversation I had with the technocrats at the CDB they're saying that they are optimistic now that we will have a driller in place by December this year that's the last information I had. Now, remember, we should have had a driller in place by June yes. of this year. Mm -hmm. So it means that we've already lost six months based on their own timeline in terms of getting something in place. Now, the problem, it appears, that some of the bidders have encountered is that the overall project is more in the order of 30, 32 million dollars. The CDB has only approved 17. So 17 is enough to get us started, but you have a funding gap. And they appear based on what I'm told, not to have had the confidence that the local government could make up the stagger, so to speak, and that we could we could we could bridge that funding gap. So we have engaged with the federal government. I want to commend them because the Prime Minister has been very uh, b bullish on this project. Yes. He's been very, you know, gung ho about it. Um, we have had some discussions. He's at the UN now. When he comes back, we hope to convene sort of an all parties meeting to determine how we're going to deal with it. We've had some friendly governments who are saying that they now have money that they're prepared to assist us with. So we're waiting to see how that will pan out. And uh, we now see the project as a national project, no longer just a local Nevis project, but a project that will provide cheap, clean electricity to all of Nevis and all of St. Kitts. That is the ambition mm -hmm. in terms of where we are now. So, as I said, I hope when he is back, we have that meeting. When we convene with the technocrats, I can come with a more fulsome report in terms of where we are. Mm -hmm. um, but that really was the issue. It has always been the issue with geothermal, the question of money and the financing on it. Segwaying very quickly to the question of, of small, small businesses business. and how, how um, can, you know, we help small businesses. One of the things you mentioned is that um, people need to prioritize and I do agree with that. 
but sometimes when there is a function for example a mango fest mm -hmm. and if we can talk about you know the spectacular turnout at the mango fest for this year and um, a lot of small businesses for example hairdressers um, nail technicians and those type of people even people who sell um, retail clothing they really benefited mm -hmm. from those type mm -hmm. of um, activities and different types of fit so even though we want our people to prioritize um, that is essential we also want them to be able to support you know small businesses when we have these type of um, activities that would perhaps drive activity in the economy so um, what are your views as it relates to, to that so I'm thinking to your point more specifically I agree with you that obviously the consumption feeds the economy mm -hmm. but my point earlier was that people need to prioritize so yes. If you know that you have your school, your child's school fees are due or your, your child support is due, or you know that your groceries are due, you need to go and pay Nevlek, then I would expect that those are the priority over some of the other things that people spend money on, mm -hmm. right? Um, you may forego the new sneakers, for example, because that's $500 and instead you use that $500 for something else. That's what I mean. It doesn't mean that other people who can afford it or who have the capacity mm -hmm. to do that shouldn't go to the nail techs and all that because they too are trying to make a living so yes. i agree with you and i would, would would sort of want to be clear in terms of what i'm saying that mm -hmm. when you have x dollars and you have y demand on that x dollars you need to try to see how you can spread that money over those demands and sometimes in doing that you cut out some of the discretionary spending because you're not in a position at that time to do so Right? We know that finance is ebb and flow. Yes. And so sometimes January, as people say, you're broke in January because you spend money during Christmas, but you're then able to build up that by maybe May, April, May, you're back in a better position. Mm -hmm. So I am saying to people, it's not as the old people say, every can knock, you got to be there. Sometimes you just have to prioritize and decide, listen, this for me is a priority right now. We have a habit of trying to keep up with the Joneses, for example, because Cleon, Stapleton, Simmons can do something may not necessarily mean that Mark Brantley or somebody else can do the same something, <laughs> right? But that's the reality. Certainly uh, Mark Brantley can do it well, and do more. <laughs> I, 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 I don't necessarily agree, but you know, um, the, the, the truth is that sometimes we're peeping over the neighbor yes. fence and we yes. want to do what the neighbor is doing. And I've had some of those experiences where I've had to say to people, listen, you know, your neighbor does this or your colleague or your friend does this, but you may not necessarily be in a position now to do it. But if you build right and you plan right, you might be in that position in due course. Now, small businesses, it's a difficult question because we live in a very small community. Yes. Businesses, small, large, or whatever, all depend on consumption. Mm -hmm. Whether you're selling goods or services, it depends on consumption. And when you're in a very small space, that is difficult. If you have, as you know, 10 people selling barbecue chicken, the population is so small that some are going to make money some are probably not going to make money simply because of the size of the population i think what we need is more innovation mm -hmm. that people need to start to look to see listen how can i do something but probably do it better or add value mm -hmm. so if i see sandy's fried chicken in brownhill and sandy's an institution been there for a long time rather than going down the, way, the road and starting mark's fried chicken trying to sell the same fried chicken as sandy maybe i should do something else right so i'm not now doing the sandy fried chicken but i'm doing maybe something with a sauce or something with a special wedges or garlic bread or something but you add some value to it mm -hmm. there's a lot of follow fashion in Nevis in terms of business i look at you i say oh she over there doing braiding here she look like she making money let me go and braid here too not realizing that you may have 10 customers braiding here when i go and open my shop i take two or three of those customers you know down to seven i have three Mm -hmm. and both of you are making not making as much as you could make so i encourage our people to be innovative because i find a lot of times we watch other people and want to do what he's doing so he opened a car wash i go up a car wash too not looking at it and saying well listen there are only x number of cars on the island so is it feasible is it viable for us to do mm -hmm. that the other thing i think is necessary is that our people need to be more educated in terms of business there are a lot of people here who open business based on emotion Okay. They open business because I like to cook, so let me open a business to cook. Mm -hmm. Right? 
because I like to cook. Not because there's any market research to determine, listen, how much goat water I could sell, how much cook-up I could sell, how much whatever, enchiladas, whatever it is I'm making. A lot of people, when they talk to me about business, the idea really is that the government is an insurer of last resort for their business. So you'd hear the argument even sometimes in the political circles, oh, business is closing down under this government. A business closed on the world over. A business may close because you have a bad product. Yes. A business may close because you have poor customer service. Mm -hmm. A business may close for a variety of factors. Your mm -hmm. rent might be too high. Right? Okay. Can so you can important. you stick a pin here? I just want to sure. ask um, a question. As mm -hmm. you mentioned small businesses and one of the, the things that I perhaps see fitting is perhaps being a, a little bit more deliberate in our approach. For example, um, is it possible for the government to assist um, in having an initiative where the government actively seek local investors and i'm just going to explain for a few minutes for example at present we have a market for elderly care our elderly homes at flamboyant that is always full to capacity at um gingerland it's the same thing okay so we know that there's a need there's a market for that because the demand is there i am not certain why no one has really taken up the initiative in terms of um opening an elderly home. So I'm just asking, is it um, perhaps a, an idea, is it feasible for your government where you identify that there is a demand, you can perhaps approach local investors, persons who may be interested um, in uh, establishing that particular business or investing in it or even pooling, having a pool of local investors. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So you might be surprised to know that we've actually tried that. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm so happy that you've identified the care for the elderly because I like your shared view. In fact, I don't believe government should be in that business at all. I think everywhere around the world, it's larger private sector driven business. Mm -hmm. And what we have in now at the Flamboyant Home, for example, which used to be a home for people who couldn't afford, yes. is that more and more people who can afford are saying, listen, we want some place for our elderly. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a need now even for daycare for the elderly because some people who are going out to work want their loved ones taken care of, but their loved ones live with them. Yes. So I want to be able to come from work and pick up my loved one and take them back home. But during the daytime, just as we take our children to daycare, we don't want to leave our loved ones, elderly loved ones mm -hmm. at home on their own. So there's a market for that as well. I will tell you that we went so far that we approached a group of Nivisions in the diaspora. Okay. And we asked them, could they jointly? We went even further and we said we were prepared to offer land mm -hmm. from the government to them for that initiative. So if there's anybody out there listening right now, the government is prepared to partner. We're even prepared to provide land as our contribution to some investor to get something like this off the ground because the demand out there is huge. Yes. We have a long waiting list at Flamboyant and mm -hmm. we have had to, rooms at Flamboyant that were designed for one occupant, mm -hmm. we're now having two beds yes. in those rooms. So there is a demand for it and I would really like for people to, to come. So we have tried that, it hasn't yielded the benefits that we thought it would yield. Nivisions on a whole are cautious. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. In terms of investors, Nivisions are cautious. You know, I c always compare our people to Anguilla, where in Anguilla, every young person wants to own their own business. People in Anguilla don't necessarily want to work for people. Uh, here, it's different. You find most of our people are looking at a job. Yes. They want to a government job or they want a job with you or some establishment. The, the risks associated with going out there on your own and doing something, our people are, tend to be risk averse. I remember speaking to a friend one time who who um, uh, did some some accounting at a previous stage in their life at one of the banks, and the person said to me that you would be amazed at the amount of money mm -hmm. people in Nevis have on the bank. Right? He said you would be amazed. You see some ordinary, what he call ordinary fellows around the road there, and you go in a bar and buy them man a drink, and they have more money than you, because he said that the bank accounts, and you know here we had a generation which religiously put their money on the bank. On the bank. Mm -hmm. But in terms of people saying, well, let me take up this $100,000. And invest. And invest it. Mm -hmm. That is something that we are not yet uh, acclimated to do. 
mm-hmm. on any large scale. So we need to encourage our people. So because there's money available here. Okay. There are a lot of people, the banks keep saying they're, they're liquid. If they're liquid, it must mean that our people have money in the banks. Mm-hmm. So we need to be able to do that. The last point I would make quickly is that people say, keep saying, well, what can the government do? What can the government do? But I think the banking sector has not been helpful either because banks make it so difficult for people to borrow. Mm-hmm. And that is why we had started this micro loan through SIDU of yes. up to $100,000 because we know a lot of those people who are 18 and 19, a single mother at the age of 28, who has an idea. It's not bankable. The bank is not going to lend them any money because the bank wants your land paper, wants you to get insurance, mm-hmm. wants you to do this, and you, you can't afford it. And then the bank is not going to give you 100%. They're going to tell you they could only give you up to this amount. So you still have to come up with some money. Most times I think the banks are not as sensitive mm-hmm. as we would like to grow in the local economy. And I understand they are res- responsible to their shareholders and they too are risk of us. Mm-hmm. But I feel sometimes that what but, we but need... But Prem, if I can mm-hmm. just interject. Um, I just want to ask you, because for our indigenous bank, local banks, Bank of Nevis as well as National Bank, the government is um, majority shareholder in both banks. How, how can the government use their shareholdership majority, their power, so to speak, in order to somewhat influence those policies as it relates to um, lending um, interest rates just just the bank coming up with different products it, it there is some leeway but I don't think as much as people think mm-hmm. because remember the banks in the region and two that you mentioned are banks in the region are all governed by central bank guidelines yes so for example on interest rates and things like those banks have a very narrow limit in which they can mm-hmm. operate um, in terms of your non-performing loans one of the big issues for the local banks is if I take a chance on Cleon, Stapleton, Simmons, and I lend her $100,000 and she can't pay back, that becomes a non-performing loan. Central banks say your non-performing loan portfolio can be over X. Mm-hmm. So people say, well, I'm not going to take the chance on her. Right? And so what you end up happening in this island and in this country is the banks lend money to people who don't need money. The banks tend to lend money to people who already have money because yes. sometimes they say, okay, you have $100,000 in the bank. I will lend you 100000 backed by the 100000 that you have there as collateral, mm-hmm. right? The people out there who don't have anything but have an idea, that is not bankable. That is where things like the development bank, I think, yes. becomes most relevant mm-hmm. because it is development banks around the world that you will now go to. They, more than the commercial banks, are the ones who, to me, should be used to influence activity in the economy in that kind of way if there's a chance to be taken on somebody they're the ones i think who should be doing that mm-hmm. um, not enough of that is being done okay in the interest of time prim because we're coming up to almost nine o'clock um i cannot leave without asking you that burning question that i believe everyone wants to know what's happening with the new hospital wing at alexandra hospital so there has been no work done on the hospital wing this year thus far and we're nine months into the year the reason for that is that the entire exterior is finished. In fact, we've painted it so as to create some c- conformity with what's currently existing and, you know, to improve the aesthetics up there generally. Mm-hmm. The interior needs to be done. The contractors said to us that they wanted some what they call quantity takeoffs for the interior. And we, based on the advice, we went ahead, we stopped the work and we went ahead and hired a quantity surveillance in kits, mm-hmm. paid for the work to be done and we're sure that the work would be done within a particular period. Let's just say that we we paid our money, we did not get the work done. The mm-hmm. quantity surveyor did not do the work, mm-hmm. did not deliver the work. So we are now caught up in some kind of litigation with that professional on sink kits. We still needed the work done. So we had now a recommendation to find some people in America who are undertaking the work. The last report we had from the Minister of Health is saying that they should be completed the work. I believe she said within six weeks mm-hmm. they should be done. So right now as I'm talking to you, maybe another month, they should be done with that work. So it basically means we had to pay them to do that work. The same amount that we had paid in sinkets to get the work done in sinkets. That is where we are. And surely you appreciate that that is a vexing issue for, for taxpayers. It's a vexing issue, but I'm not sure sometimes why it's such a vexing issue and i'll tell you why we budgeted 20 million dollars on that project so far we spent just about 17. so the project is not over budget at this point we have not gone over what we said we would spend is it possible that we will go over yes but at this point we have not yet done so 
there is no wastage of resources because there's no work happening at the moment. So it's not as if people are there every day getting paid and not doing anything. We stopped the work and said we'll wait to get this technical report done, then we will resume the work. So yes, people look at it and say, oh, it's taking too long. And I agree. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to shy away from that. The project should have been completed by now. But we've had these concerns and these difficulties. What I will say to our people is that whilst there's a lot of noise about the hospital wing, the new wing, if Mark Brantley now lives in a house with his family and Mark Brantley decides he's going to build a new house, if that house takes longer than anticipated to finish that new house, it has not affected Mark Brantley's ability to live where he currently is. I don't think people understand that we are not affecting the current hospital and the current hospital's operations. We are not. In fact, throughout the period that this new wing, as we call it, which is essentially a new hospital, that's two and a half times the size of the existing hospital, is being built. We have not only continued serving our public at the Alexandra Hospital, we've actually enhanced the services there. Mm -hmm. If you go there now, we have more doctors and nursing staff than we've ever had in the history, more specializations, more and better and more sophisticated equipment. All of that is now available to the people of Davis. Brand new yes. ambulances, all of that. So there is, there is no negative impact on our ability to deliver quality health care to our people because the new wing is not yet mm -hmm. complete. That is not an excuse. We need to finish the new wing. But I'm just saying that people need to understand that the two are not necessarily connected in terms of the quality of service that we are providing to the mm -hmm. Navy. I think people do understand that, but people really want to have uh, increase in services. For example, I could imagine that once the new wing is completed, perhaps we would have dialysis um, services available here on Nevis. So I think it's just a, a matter of people wanting those services and, and just of the view that it is taking too long to deliver that to the, the general so public. So in relation to services, the only new service that I'm aware of that will be delivered at the new facility would be dialysis. Mm -hmm. All the other services that are currently available to us will be still available to us they are those services are not going to change maybe the environment you know, have, might have a bigger room to do the physiotherapy but the physiotherapy is not being done so other than dialysis and I think the dialysis patients have obviously a legitimate case to make but other than that there are no new services that we anticipate being mm -hmm. provided in the new wing that are not currently being provided and being provided at the highest levels at the Alexandra Hospital okay so mm -hmm. premier almost off time but we just want to touch on uh, um, the issue, the whole issue of um, political maturity. So we're looking at 40 years and we are now 40 years later. How do you think we we have fared in the, the past 40 years in terms of our political maturity and being able to be civil and, and cordial because it does affect our culture? I don't think we've done well enough. Um, and as I've got older in politics, I realized that uh, there's some of the fights that they engage in that are unnecessary. Um, there's a lot of the vitriol that is unnecessary. There are people, for example, who expressed grave concern that I was coming here to have a conversation <laughs> with you tonight because you and I don't belong <laughs> to the same political party or the same political, share the same political views. I think there has to be room in our country for dialogue and conversation. Sir. We have to stop with this this politics of personal vilification and attack. And I've seen you under attack, so I know you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I have endured it from the moment I entered politics. It has been part of my experience in politics. There are some people out there who, when they do not have a message that can appeal to voters, they have really nothing to offer in terms of their own ideas, policy, their own personal appeal that they then resort to attacking others who they perceive have those things. And that is really what it comes down to. The ability to have a civil discourse. You and I sitting here tonight from different political parties, being seen together, having a conversation about Nevis, having a conversation about what is good, what is bad, what needs fixing, what we can do, is an important conversation and it's an important optic mm -hmm. for our people because I think that it is a demonstration of maturity. I have, for example, and I've said this publicly, that I did not know our new Prime Minister, Dr. Drew, until he became Prime Minister. Yes. When I say I didn't know him, meaning I never had a conversation with him. Mm -hmm. I recall seeing him at a church service and shaking his hand and saying hello. But the first time I sat down and we exchanged 
in terms of a conversation was after he became Prime Minister. Right? He has struck me as somebody who is sincere. And in his dealings with Nevis, he has been very straightforward with me. And so I have said to Dr. Juju, listen, it's important that the NIA and the federal government has a have a relationship. Let us work together on that. But it shouldn't surprise you, and sadly the way we are now, it shouldn't surprise many that even a picture taken between the Premier and the Prime Minister creates grave consternation in some quarters. Mm -hmm. People get upset about it because the, the federal government and the NIA should be at war, or more importantly, Mark Brantley and Terence, you should be at war. And if you're not at war, people feel somehow you've sold out or you're, 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 you, you, you know, you've compromised yourself because our politics has for so long been defined by people being at each other's throats. Yes. And I feel that there's a time, the Bible says so, I think it's Ecclesiastes, which tells you there's a time for everything under heaven, right? Mm -hmm. There's a time for governance and there's a time, I think, for the politics, yes. right? You and I fought against each other last election. I wanted you to lose bad, 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 and I'm sure you wanted me to lose bad, bad, bad. But at the end of the day, the people spoke, the people cast their votes. We accept the will of the people, and you now need to move on, because once the election is done, you now have to govern. Yes. What is the point of continuing night after night, day after day, bashing, bashing, bashing people, getting personal with people, making up stories about people? There's not even an election <laughs> that's in the, in the air. So you go down that road, and I don't think it leads to anything other than divisions in the community. The irony of it is that people then turn around and accuse you. You get in bash, and people then turn around and accuse you and say you're the one dividing people. But you're not bashing anybody. Mm -hmm. You're just going about doing the work. And I think that there's some people who are resentful that they're not in government, they haven't been able to get into government, and rather than really doing a self-analysis and determining well, what are our faults what is it that we're doing wrong right because if you keep losing election after election it must mean you're doing something wrong instead of that you turn all this venom on and every election cycle you dial it up a notch and you get more personal and more vitriolic so I, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done mm -hmm. I'm committed to that work however and that's why I'm here tonight I, I think a lot of it has to do with leadership at, at the end of the day I mean leadership requires maturity and you have to get people not just be able to persuade them to vote for you to to elect a government but also you have to use your leadership and your influence in order to control the behavior and dialogue of people mm -hmm. because I can't understand and how some leaders can allow political parties to personally attack persons and then yet go and give a speech about crime. It, it, it really doesn't make sense, okay? And so, to me, actions speak louder than words and it, it really, you know, we need in this country mature leadership, people who can look at things, who can take, be diplomatic, and I think it's very important. Now, you mentioned your relationship um, with Terence Dew, um, Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, Honorable Terence Dew. And one of the things that really struck out at me was that whole experience when we went to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Now, the naysayers had many things to oh, say about course, that, <laughs> that particular trip. And I often tell people, I think that was where reality, in a sense, struck me because, you know, I was uh, invited as a, the, the lone opposition member for the Nevis Reformation Party at that time. And to really be able to, to see how... Um, I think there were three parties, the Labour Party, mm -hmm. um, CCM, and NRP, mm -hmm. to see us as a delegation, of as course. a guest of the Prime Minister, be able to work together and just deliver in that entire exercise. I was like, wow, this is a completely different Absolutely. side to me. And it really exposed me as to what governance and, and diplomacy really is. So, Prim, we are out of time. <laughs> I see the signal, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for um, being a guest on The Legendary and for really explaining certain things that were um, perhaps in people's mind. I hope people know they have a clearer understanding and a, a better picture. I did not get the opportunity to ask you questions specifically as it relates to my constituency. And so, of course, I will be coming at you as it relates to those things because there's some a lot of work that needs to be done, particularly in the cotton-grown area. And I'm still 
agitating for a bathroom facility at the cotton gown um play field so um we will get in touch um to to have those discussions um i extend the invitation again for us to have this type of um dialogue whether it be on my show legendary or on your show on the map so i just want to thank you i want to thank all those who tuned in this evening on um, the listening and viewing audience thank you and i wish everyone a blessed rest of the week thank you so much thank you